This is Touchdown Song, a look at music and sports. I'm Tom Hedden. I spent 19 years writing music for NFL films. In this segment, we'll talk about the music that makes you feel the action. There used to be a time, not that long ago, where people would write songs that made you buy stuff. The idea was, when you heard the tune, it could only make you think of one thing. There are still a few songs around that have that effect. There's this one. And this one. And there are a few more. And those are the ones we're going to talk about. Because when you hear these songs, the one and only thing you can think about is sports. There's this one. You could pull, you know, the little old lady in Florida out of her house and she'd probably be able to sing it to you. And there's this one. That's become kind of the national anthem of pro football. How do these songs get written? What are the tricks to creating a song that, when you hear it, you think football? I've been very fortunate in my career. I've written a bunch of these songs myself. Maybe not as famous as those other ones, but ones you've heard. So I know a little bit about it, and so do the other people here with me. Uh, my name is Scott Schreer, and the name of my company is NJJ Music. In 1994, Scott Schreer got an assignment. The call came from a man he knew at ABC Sports named George Greenberg. He was responsible at ABC for the Are You Ready for Some Football at ABC. George was going out to California to meet some TV executives who wanted a new song. George wanted Scott to write the song, but he didn't give Scott a lot to go on. All George knew was that one of the TV executives had recently taken his kids to Six Flags Amusement Park, where they rode the Batman roller coaster. So he told George that he thought the theme should be like a Batman on steroids kind of sound to it. Scott got together with the other two musicians he worked with. Scott's a drummer. I always approach things from a very rhythmic and bombastic point of view. And my two co-writers, one of them was an expert piano player, as well as a computer guy. And the, the third piece of the triangle was a, a concert cello player. They worked all weekend and came up with two songs that George took to California for the TV executives. The one who'd taken his kids on the Batman ride was named David. David reacted very strongly to the front section of one... and very strongly to the middle part of the second piece of music. And when he came to New York to meet us, uh, as he told us what his preferences were, before he could finish his sentence, my co-writer, engineer, had already had the session up in Pro Tools and had edited it together um, and hit the play button for David like before he finished the sentence, and he like was amazed that that could be done. And 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 then that became you know the front of one piece, then the second part of the other piece became the NFL and Fox theme, which everybody's heard for the last 16, 17 years. Today, we take it for granted that the music that goes along with sports highlights will sound a certain way, like the music I've written and the other people have written for NFL films, or themes like the one Scott wrote for Fox. But it hasn't always been like that. Over for a touchdown, and 1957 in sports slid to a finish. And so the year slipped away. This is the kind of music they used to use with sports. 1957 broke into the sporting headlines in boldface type and thrilled its fans from year in to year out. This is a newsreel, which is what they had before TV was invented. You watched it at the movies while you were waiting for the feature to come on. Newsreels were the only way you could see a football game unless you'd been there live. If the newsreel companies wanted music that said sports, they'd play what you'd hear at a college football game. In other words, they'd put on a marching band. 
Oklahoma again ruled the college football scene, but the Sooners didn't go undefeated. In the year's outstanding gridiron upset, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame scored the only touchdown of a hard and closely fought game. As my old colleague at NFL Films, Dave Rovido, puts it, They saw it more as news than they did drama. And drama is the key difference between football on film then and football on film today. It wasn't until the 1950s that people started to realize there was drama in football games, just like in the movies. Winners and losers, joy and sadness, anger, hope, and nail-biting suspense. This is Chuck Thompson speaking to you from Yankee Stadium, where the Baltimore Colts are playing in the first overtime period in the history of professional football. In 1958, the Colts played the Giants in the NFL championship game. It was the first time a game had ever been shown on coast-to-coast TV, and the first time a championship game had ever gone into overtime. It was exciting, and it gave people a whole new image of professional football. Four years later, that image was made even better when an amateur filmmaker named Ed Sable made a movie about the NFL championship game that was completely different from anything that anyone had ever done. With the aid of some movie magic, we'll analyze that last play. They put a microphone on the quarterback. Listen to Bart Starr in the Green Bay huddle. Blue right, 41 quick. They shot from multiple angles. They shot on the sidelines. Starr and Kramer are welcomed on the sideline by Paul Hornung and coach Vince Lombardi. No one had ever done anything like this before. As Dave Robito puts it, they combined Hollywood with documentary filmmaking. As we rerun that play, look for Nitschke's rugged rush and Curry's grab. The NFL loved the result and gave Ed Sable the money to start NFL Films. Now, if you listen to the music in that first movie, you'll hear they're still just playing marches, like they always did. Don't let that sunshine fool you. This ground is frozen like an ice skating rink, as Packers Jim Taylor and Ron Kramer fast find out. That was about to change, too. Those marches were written by a man named Malin Merrick. To save money, he had them recorded in Germany by a young composer named Sam Spence. Here's Sam today. He said, could you conduct it for me? I said, sure. And he said, and would you like to write a couple of pieces? And that was my downfall. I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to write a couple of pieces. Or upfall, I guess why I should say. Like that first movie Ed Sable had shot, the two songs that Sam wrote were like nothing anyone had ever experienced. They weren't sports marchers. They were more with my signature, you know, which is kind of the Hollywood sound, you know. Ed Sable took the music back to America, and when he listened to it, he knew he didn't want Malin Merrick anymore. He wanted Sam Spence. And I said, gee, I'm very flattered, but... I couldn't do that. And he said, why couldn't you do that? And I said, well, <laughs> Malin Merrick is a good friend of mine, and, and I'd be uh, like stabbing him in the back. And he said, what kind of a Sunday school did you go to? <laughs> Here's the thing that NFL Films did that changed sports movies forever. They didn't set out to make documentaries. They wanted to make dramatic films, just like Hollywood. And because they were the movie company for the whole league, they had to create films that would overcome team loyalty. Think about it. If you have a group of Cowboys fans and you show a New York Giant catching the ball in the end zone, the Cowboy fans are going to hate it. But not if the filmmaker is telling a story where he needs to create sadness or empathy. To do that, you need to use everything at your disposal to overcome people's feelings about the particular teams involved. So music became a really important tool for NFL films. Working with Sam gave NFL Films a lot of flexibility. They could make the music sound contemporary. They'd go to Sam and say, make it sound like this movie or that movie, like the song you're hearing now, which sounds like The Magnificent Seven by Elmer Bernstein. And this was all very popular for a while, But by the time I got to NFL Films, it was time for a change. Dave Robito and I worked in the same building as the filmmakers, and we had the advantage of knowing exactly what type of music was needed for each different project. That meant we didn't have to make our music sound like something else. 
we could just be ourselves and write music that fit with the pictures. Because it's documentary filmmaking, we're working with true emotion. Again, here's Dave Robita. De Niro's an amazing actor and probably one of the best. And uh, I don't even think he could capture the emotion of John Elway finally running around the, the arena with the Lombardi trophy in his hand. And what emotion there is. Triumph, failure, striving. There's excitement in any sporting event. When I coached my kids, I used to joke that it was as exciting to watch 14-year-olds play softball as watching the Packers in the Super Bowl. But with the big games, there's nothing like the scope and spectacle. You also want to capture the fear and the trepidation. One reason we aren't all pro football players is because it's scary. So our music needs to make you feel the butterflies and the nerves and anticipation. There's also the impact and the violence and the chaos. There's the struggle and the ability to succeed, the joy. And the devastation and loss. As composers, Dave and I and Sam have a lot of tools at our disposal. At its essence, football music is timpani, trombones, cello and horns. Here's Sam. I did use French horns a lot for, you know, victory and uh, it gets a nice victorious sound. The French horn. The percussion matches everything you think of as football. When they're they're running out of the tunnel into the stadium for the opening kickoff, it's the energy of that. Two 300-pound guys hitting each other. It's the speed of it. And you can't forget the woodwinds and the trumpets. Without them, you lose the sparkle. Without the violins, you lose the speed. Also, I find the trombone is so versatile. It gives you both percussion and melody. And I have to say, cellos are just so cool. How can you not? So what kind of person goes into writing music for sports on TV and film? Well, Sam Spence studied classical music composition in college. Dave Robito went to a grade school where the principal really cared about music. For me, I was pretty much always taking music lessons, but in the fall, I was playing football. By the time I reached high school, I could play a dozen different instruments, but none of them very well. And after a couple of broken bones on the football field, I decided to concentrate on music and master the bass guitar. That's when my teachers and musician friends convinced me to go to music school for college. It's a funny thing. The music we write is so well known. Because of the reach of TV, the songs that Dave, Sam, and I have written have been heard by as many people as Beethoven or Mozart. An audience like that can definitely give you a swelled head. But Scott Schreer, who wrote the NFL on Fox theme, has a really healthy way of looking at it. It comes from some advice that a friend gave him once. And he said to me, just remember, when you get in, as you get into this business, that when someone says to you, gee, that's a genius piece of music, that genius is directly proportional to how many times you see and hear something. The more you see and hear it, the more you go, yeah, I kind of like that, you know. Though Scott does admit he gets a kick out of it when he hears someone singing his songs. I was shopping at Macy's, and as we were exiting off the escalator, um, the, the guy with the mop was whistling 
the NFL and Fox theme, you know. And I turned around to my wife and I said, you know, that was pretty cool. That was something. That guy whistling the NFL and Fox theme just like hit me between the eyes. It was like, okay, it was really cool. It is pretty cool. Right now, Scott's still a young guy and he's always tried to keep it in perspective. But Sam Spence says he's learned to sit back and enjoy it. You know, when you get to be a certain age, why money doesn't make any difference, but being appreciated really is nice. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Hedden for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Thank you.